In this lecture, we are continuing the ideas which we've been approaching in the past few lectures, which is how do we actually show a statistical difference. Uh, and from starting from now, now that we've kind of like built up the background, we're going to be moving a lot faster as we introduce many of the actual statistical tests that you'll be using in, uh, in your actual research projects or where you, that you actually start seeing in actual journal papers. Now we'll start this lecture by introducing the t-distribution. And the t-distribution is something that you actually be using inside your uh, actual research projects. The t-distribution is actually a replacement of the z-distribution, and we'll cover that in a moment. We'll also look at different conditions, what happens when your data fits different type of, uh, different type of conditions. For example, what happens if you're, data, if you're trying to compare single means? What happens if you're trying to compare pair groups? What happens when you want to compare independent groups? And in the previous lecture, we actually already worked with single means. And uh, you realize that when we look at the examples. Except, of course, uh, in the previous lecture, we're still working with single means in the Z distribution. Then we'll take a look at what happens when our data doesn't actually fit our conditions of normality. That's what they mean here by non-parametric procedures. Parametric here, they refer to the parameters inside a normal distribution, you know, the mean and the standard deviation. So when your data doesn't fit the conditions of parametrism, or in other words, when it's not normally distributed, then you have to use something different. It's no longer using these t-distributions anymore. As mentioned, there are many different ways in which a research question can be asked. And here we have three common scenarios for research questions. First, the simplest one is single means. An example of this is when you collect one uh, a single sample from a particular group and you're saying, is this sample different from the accepted norm? Or is this sample that I'm collecting from, is, uh, is it different from the population mean or is it different from the control population or whatnot? Right? So in other words, I already have the population parameters that I'm comparing to, which is like the population mean and the population standard deviation. And so <coughs> if you probably realize by now that in the previous lecture, we've already been doing these kind of scenarios, of course, with the Z distribution. More commonly, however, you probably approach these, the independent groups and the paired groups. More commonly, independent groups. Independent groups is you have two samples you're collecting from, and each of these samples come from two different groups, and you want to say, are they different? In other words, do these two samples come from different populations? Are they have, do they have different population means? Then there are the paired groups, which also you have two samples. However, these two samples, the individuals inside the samples are actually one and the same person. Meaning, let's say, uh, the guy here, individual A here, is the same as the guy over here, individual A. The only difference being, okay, usually, usually, the only difference being in terms of this is A before treatment or before some intervention, and this is A after intervention, and this is B before and this is B after. And because the individuals here and individuals here are exactly the one and the same person. This is called a paired group, and they have to be treated in a slightly different way. Now, a paired, a paired research question is stronger or is able to give you a better conclusion than independent groups, but it's, usually, but it's not so easy to carry out a paired, uh, a paired comparison. Now, a quick refresher on what we mean by statistical difference. Or in other words, how do I decide whether there is a statistical difference? Is it enough for me to just look at the absolute difference between two means? For example, let's say I have a mean here and a mean here. This is from group 1, this is from group 2. So the question is, are they different? Now obviously, if this value here, this is a 3 and this is a 7, if this value here were the population mean of group A and this here were the population mean of group B, I'll immediately say, yes, of course, they are different because 3 is not the same as 7. Now, the problem is, of course, in real life, when we do our research, this is not the population mean. I do not know the population mean of this, and I do not know the population mean of this. The, popu the actual population mean of group A could be anywhere. could be anywhere in a particular spectrum, in a particular distribution. And the population mean of group B could also be in its own distribution. And so to answer the question, is there a difference, we need to look at the two distributions and their overlap. So we need to look at the variation, the shape of the two distributions, the two sampling distributions, whether they overlap, how much they overlap, and whatnot. 
So a combination of the mean and the standard deviation is used for the test statistic. For example, we calculate z equals mean over standard deviation. Of course, that is for the population values. What we will be using is the x bar bar or the mean of the sample means divided by the standard error. And that gives, and that gives us a normalized value of the standard deviations or that gives us a normalized value of the variation or the width of the distributions. Okay, one or both of them. And using these widths or using these variations, then we are able to answer the question. Taking the widths, the variations of these two groups, these two distributions, these two sampling distributions into account, are we confident enough then to say that yes, they are different or no, I'm not sure where they are dif different. So, a summary. To decide whether there is a difference, we need three things. First, we need to know the absolute difference between the two means. We have a sample mean 1, a sample mean 2, and obviously if the difference between the two sample means is greater, is very large, then it's easier for us to conclude that yes, there is a statistical difference. Second, we need to look at the variability the standard deviation or more accurately the standard error because usually or virtually all the time we're working with sampling distributions we look at the variability because the variability determines the width of the distribution the size of the distribution the shape of the distribution and so obviously if the variability is smaller the distribution is tighter or narrower and so the smaller the variability, once again, the easier it is for us to conclude that there is a statistically significant difference. You can think of this as the z value. Remember, z equals to the difference of the means divided by the standard error, which is the variability. So the smaller the variability here, the higher z will go. The larger the difference between the means, the higher z will go as well. The last one is the sample size, and the main effect of the sample size is affects the variability because the standard error equals to sam st uh, standard deviation divided by square root of n. So n here, its effect is on variability, uh, and the effect of this, once again, is upon uh, how easy it is to find a statistically significant difference. Now, I mentioned in the past that we've been taking some assumptions and kind of not, not accounting for them. Now let's think about the stuff that we have accounted for. We don't know what is the actual population mean of the samples that we are collecting. However, we estimate our population mean using our sample mean. We estimate mu using uh, x bar. And we do that, for example, by using confidence intervals. Also, hypothesis tests, okay, when we want to make comparisons. And this is how we reflect the uncertainty in which we not know mu. Now, however, when we calculate our test statistic, we use the population standard deviation sigma. And of course, we do not know the population standard deviation sigma as well, just as we do not know the population mean. And we estimate sigma using the sample standard deviation or S. And as mentioned, up till now, we've kind of like assuming that S equals sigma. Sigma equals S, and everything is fine and good. But of course, S is not exactly sigma. So where is the uncertainty reflected here? Where is the, how come we don't have something like these confidence intervals for sigma? This brings us to the T distribution. Now the T distribution is a uh, theoretical statistical distribution, just like the normal distribution, just like the standard normal distribution, also known as the Z distribution. And the T distribution is also another statistical distribution just like that. So just like all the rest, it means that it is, uh, it is, uh, it is. There's a formula that describes it, and the area underneath the curve, right, is one, and it's a continuous distribution. So it stretches from negative infinity to positive infinity, and incidentally, it looks very, very similar to the normal distribution, with some slight variation, right. Now the history behind this is that uh, this fellow, William Gossett, a statistician. A long time ago, hundred, uh, more than 100 years ago, he discovered that S is a reliable estimate of sigma at sample sizes of greater than 30, or more than great, or 30 or greater, right? Assuming that the population is normally distributed, okay? Now, so there are two conditions if we want to make this, if we want to use this assumption that S is more or less equal to sigma, right? 
First being our sample size must be at least 30. Second is that it must be normally distributed. However, what happens if either of these two uh, are not met or if either of these, or more importantly, if this particular normal dis distributed one, you are not absolutely sure. Okay, maybe it's not absolutely normally distributed or the sample size just isn't big enough. That's when you use the t-distribution. The t-distribution is similar to the standard normal distribution or the z-distribution, but there's some extra accounts, there's some extra uh, extra adjustments inside there which accounts for the extra uncertainty meaning it's kind of like adding extra uncertainty when your sample size is small he's saying when your sample size is small s is no longer that good or reliable estimate of sigma and therefore we are no longer so sure that the actual confidence interval let's say we're doing calculate confidence interval lies between here and here we're not so sure maybe it lies slightly wider right because we need to put in this extra uncertainty that s may not actually be a reliable estimate of sigma and this occurs more often when your sample size is small now this will make more sense when we actually look at what the t distribution looks like so this is the t distribution notice it looks exactly like a normal distribution and it looks like a normalized normal distribution or in other words the standard normal distribution what is the standard normal distribution the standard normal distribution is the normal distribution where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one okay now the t distribution looks exactly like it except there is one extra parameter the extra parameter is now called degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom is simply calculated as n minus 1, where n here is the sample size. If you look at the t distribution in these dotted lines, okay, these dotted lines show the different t distributions for different values of n. Sorry, different values of n minus 1 or degrees of freedom. So for example, this here is t infinity, meaning that this is the t distribution where the, n, where the sample size is huge, let's say very, very, very big, let's say a thousand, okay? Degrees of freedom then would be 999. Now, when the, t when, when the degrees of freedom is high enough, the t distribution is exactly identical to a z distribution, is exactly identical to a standard normal distribution. However, if the degrees of freedom or the sample size is slow, or in other words, remember what just now he said, lower than 30 okay if it's smaller than that notice what happens to the t distribution this is degrees of freedom of 25 this one is degrees of freedom 5 this is a degrees of freedom of 1 meaning this is a this is the t distribution where your sample size is only 2 right if your sample size is only 2 obviously the standard deviation is not a very reliable estimate meaning your s is not a very good estimate of sigma so how does he reflect that? He reflects that by making the standard error wider. Okay, the variability of this particular distribution is wider compared to if it was if the degrees of freedom was higher. Now, because the only difference with the t distribution is adding in this extra accountability for this extra. Uh, this extra consideration for the degrees of freedom or the sample size to consider where s with the s is a reliable estimate of sigma so for all intents and purposes t should replace z as far as you can right there's an extra step to calculate n minus one and because of this extra parameter the table the truth table if you look inside for the t distribution is slightly different but make it a habit to use the t distribution from now on it is the more accurate distribution and if you publish papers or in journal papers, almost everyone is using T rather than using Z. Now let's repeat the conclusions. For sample sizes 30 or greater, the T distribution is more or less equal to the Z distribution. In fact, for sample sizes that are really high, like 1000, 2000, okay, in theory infinity, the T distribution is the Z distribution. They're identical. But when N is smaller, then the larger standard deviation means that researchers need to observe a larger difference to show significance or in other words the larger standard deviation or the larger variability of that sampling distribution of t right means that researchers need to observe a larger difference to show significance means that when we calculate the t 
test statistic now. The test statistic now is t, not z anymore. So t equals to be the difference of means divided by the standard error. Correct? Now, if the standard error here, due to the due to this adjustment of the t distribution with larger variability, the standard error now is smaller. Com uh, sorry, the standard error here is larger compared to the z equivalent. So if the standard error is larger here, then to get the same value of the t statistic compared to the z statistic, the difference in means on the top on the numerator needs to be larger. Okay, got it? Because they balance out t equals to be difference in means divided by standard error. Just like z equals difference in means divided by standard error. So when you have smaller n, the equivalent standard error of t is larger compared to if you were in z. And so the difference in means here has to be larger as well to get to the same conclusion. This is this is the this is the reason why they say that the t distribution adds in some extra uh, some extra considerations to account for the uh, variable to account for the unknowns uh, the uncertainties of s being an estimate of sigma. Now all that being said, the t distribution still needs this assumption that the observations are normally distributed, meaning that if you are not sure or if you cannot show that your observations are normally distributed, you actually need to jump to use different methods and they are the non-parametric methods which we talk about later. As you can probably guess, the calculations required to do either the estimation part or the hypothesis testing part for the t-distribution is exactly the same as how you do it for the z-distribution. Meaning, the critical ratio for z is difference in means divided by the standard error. Critical ratio for t is also the difference in means divided by the standard error. Similarly, if you want to do estimation uh, for meaning confidence intervals, it's just a replacement of z with t. That's it. Okay. Now let's try it out with an example. Let's work with a scenario which we've done previously in the past, which is single groups, assuming they're normally distributed, of course. Kyphoscoliosis is a deformation of the spine. After resulting in respiratory failure, researchers were interested whether failure is due to mechanical abnormalities or weak respiratory muscles. Researchers measured the maximal inspiratory mouth pressure, or the PI max, of nine patients and compared the results to a known standard of normality. So what are we doing here? We are comparing patients with kyphoscoliosis. We are measuring their maximal inspiratory mouth pressure, that's the PI max. Our sample size is nine, and we're comparing it to a known standard of normality. We're comparing it to a control group out of the normal population of where their PI max, their mean PI max is known. So here are our nine patients. There are nine individual PI max values. We can, of course, calculate a sample mean and a sample standard deviation here. And we're comparing it to a known standard mean of 110. Now notice here I didn't give the population standard deviation here. So in this case, just assume we are using this as the population standard deviation, right? Just like what the estimate was doing earlier. Now, so the question now is, could our patients the sample that we collected our patients from, could our patients actually have a similar population mean of 110? And how do we do that? In this case, we want to do it by using a 99% confidence interval. Now remember, we want to do this using the T distribution for now, right? The T distribution. So what's the T what's the what's the degrees of freedom in this case? Degrees of freedom is n minus 1, n is 9, so degrees of freedom is 8. Give it a try and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so calculating the confidence interval is the sample mean plus minus the t value as well as the multiply by the standard error. Now the t value for a 99% confidence interval given a degrees of freedom of 8 is 3.355. So it's 41.27 plus minus 3.355. Uh, multiply standard error, which in this case, because we don't have the population standard deviation, we just replace it by this case here, and that's taken, and that's fine because the t distribution takes into account the assumption here that s is a good enough, uh, is a good enough estimate of sigma. Right. So 16.23 divided by square root of nine, 
and we get the confidence interval here of 23.11 to 59.42 I forgot to put the units here so the conclusion then is that no it is unlikely we are 90 but nine well by this 99 percent confidence interval our conclusion is no our kyphoscoliosis patients do not have a similar pi max to the uh, control group or the to the compared population mean of 110 because 110 lies outside of our 99 percent confidence interval so let's try it again but this time using a hypothesis test same thing all the parameters are the same so could a kyphoscoliosis patients have a PI max population mean of 110 or in other words could the kyphoscoliosis patients actually come from the same population as the normals or as the control group or could the kyphoscoliosis patients their population mean be the same as the population mean of the control group which is 110 okay so give it a try remember to do the null hypothesis and carry out all the steps so if you did it well, then the null hypothesis H0 should be like uh, the mu of kyphoscoliosis patients equals to be the mu of the norm or the control group. In other words, equals 110. And because we intend to do a two-tailed, since it didn't say here, so we do a two-tailed by default, then the alternative hypothesis should be not equal to 110, right? or not equal to the mu of the uh, control group or the normal population. Now, the alpha value here, is 0 0.05 so the first thing you should probably should do is to find out what is the t alpha so the t alpha equals 0 0.05 degrees of freedom is 8 look up the table that should be about 2.3 then we calculate the critical ratio for t equals to 41.27 minus of 110 divided by the standard error standard error is standard deviation divided by square root of n where n is the sample size and you get negative 12.70 which if you compare to the t alpha here is obviously uh, more much more extreme or in other words this is greater or more negative than a uh, negative 2.3 keep in mind two tilt so it could be either negative 2.3 or positive 2.3 so the conclusion then is yes reject the null hypothesis kyphoscoliosis patients do not have a population mean of 110 now let's continue by looking at a new scenario. What happens when your research question involves paired groups rather than a group versus a known mean? Now as mentioned previously, paired groups means you have two groups here or two samples, but the individuals in the, within this group and the individuals within this group are actually one and the same. Or a bit more lenient version of paired groups is they're not actually the same, but they have been matched. They have been matched in a certain way. Strictly speaking, uh, it's best they're the same individual though. So taken for example, is the same group of people pre and post treatment. Okay, so these individuals before, let's say, eating drug A and after eating drug A, or match case control, where there are two different groups of people. However, you match them as closely as possible. So individual A is, let's say, a Chinese male that's 50 years old, has no uh, incidence of heart failure and so uh, heart disease. And in group B, individual number one is also a Chinese male that's age 50, blah, 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 blah. As in, you try to make these two people as similar as possible. So a slightly more lenient version of that is also called paired groups or matched. Right? So when you fulfill this condition, where the individuals in this group and individuals in that group are matched, one to one, one to one, then you can do a special version of comparison. Now, a special version of comparison here is you're no longer comparing the sample mean here to the sample mean here. Remember, usually what do we do? We calculate the mean of all the individuals here. We call it the sample mean and we compare to the other one over here and look at the mean difference. Or previously, it was the mean sample mean minus the population mean, where the population is the one we're comparing to. But in this case, since all the individuals match, now we are actually measuring the difference of individual to individual. And, the, uh, and then what we calculate is the average of all the differences okay so there's a subtle difference here the first is the average of this group versus the average of this group now we are actually because we can match them so we calculate the difference of each individual pair and then we get so we get one difference second difference third difference fourth difference and we get the average of all those differences Okay, this is only possible when you have paired groups, when you have matched individuals. The good thing about this is that it helps to control for external factors or variations that may influence the result. 
and this is best illustrated by the example uh, by the example in the next slide let's illustrate the advantage of having paired groups let's consider this example uh, it's a bunch of people who are undergoing a weight loss program so after the, the here's their weight before and their weight after and let's assume the entire population is only of six people so if you noticed this weight loss program actually works and everyone has lost uh, 5 kilograms after the weight loss program and so if you look at their population means 95.5 versus 90.5 now if I were to take a sample which consists of all six people here and a sample which consists of all six people there and I were to compare the two sample means there wouldn't be much problems because I'm comparing 95.5 to 90.5 however notice that within each group there is a variation among individuals meaning within here there's a standard deviation the sample mean standard deviation and that what does that actually mean it means within this sample group the individuals here differ from each other differ from their mean which means there are some fat people and there are some thin people now let's pretend that I did not do this in the pad group fashion meaning I tried to take this as an independent group and an independent group meaning I try to perform this uh, this research study by I'm going to randomly take a bunch of people here who have not done the who have not gone through the diet program and then these people go through the diet program and I randomly pick another group of people who go through the diet program now uh, this might sound a bit strange but it actually happens very often for example let's say uh, the diet program lasts one year you don't want to wait one year however the diet program is a continuing process there are always people coming in there are always people finishing up so at one point in time you say I'm going to measure the people a bunch of people who are going who are entering the diet program and I'm also going to measure another group of people who so happen to be exiting or finishing the diet program that be an example where they aren't paired they aren't paired but you are still trying to do the same kind of research question so assuming the unpaired, I would have randomly selected a bunch of people in the before group and the other and the after group. So let's say I'm picking three from before and three from after. Now it could so happen that when I picked the three before, these were the three I picked. When I picked from the after, these are the three I picked for the after group. Now notice everyone in the before group and everyone in the after group, the before group, these tend to be the these tend to be the the lighter people and this happened to be the heavier people now on average of course I would have picked a more random one but this could happen and if I did it this way then the sample mean I'll get in the before group and the sample mean I'll calculate in the after group I'll actually conclude then that this diet program actually makes people heavier on average and that's because the variation within the individuals in a group is larger or in other words it overrode the variation between the two groups I'm trying to examine the variation between these two groups I'm not really interested in the variation within the group I'm assuming it is random right and this thing could happen if I do not control if I do not match and so that's where pad groups come in soon. useful I briefly mentioned earlier what's the difference between uh, pad groups versus non pad groups in other words how do we carry out the statistical analysis the main difference here is that in paired groups individual to individual individual to individual and so when you have the two matched individuals here you can calculate the difference between them and so there's the difference for individual one difference for individual two before and after difference for individual three before and after and all these differences then you calculate the mean of all those differences so in other words your critical ratio here the critical ratio for t is not based on sample mean 1 minus sample mean 2 or sample mean 1 minus the population mean the known one it's just t is the mean of the difference divided by the standard error okay and similar here if you want to do confidence intervals uh, it is a replacement here as well the diff it's the difference here and and this is the the t value for uh, the t value for the appropriate confidence uh, interval that we should have selected and uh, standard deviation and so on and this is the standard deviation of the difference okay so meaning all the individual differences you can calculate a mean difference and the the standard deviation of the differences so let's look at an example pad groups normally distributed chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure are patients with excess carbon dioxide retention 
Researchers were interested whether the diet could play a role in treatment. So researchers followed 8 patients, n equals 8, on a special diet and measured their arterial oxygen tension pre and post study. So this is definitely PAD because it's a pre, a post, following 8 patients and we want to see whether there, there's, there's a change, there's a difference. So we start by using confidence intervals here. Here are the 8 patients, here are their pre values and here are their post values. We don't actually need to calculate these, what we are interested in is this column. Pre, post, difference here is, well you can do post minus pre or pre minus post, it's up to you, it doesn't matter, just make sure you're consistent throughout. But let's assume you do the logical which is post minus pre, so here it's 12, 7, 12 and so on and so forth. We calculate a D bar, which is the mean of the differences and the standard deviation of the differences. So now the question, do chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients benefit from a special diet? Check using a 95% confidence interval. Right? So, calculate using a 95% confidence interval and give it a shot. So, the 95% confidence interval, the degrees of freedom in this case n minus 1, n being 8, so degrees of freedom is 7. Look up the table, the correct value for t here then should be 2.365. Multiply by the standard error plus minus the uh, the mean difference and you get this. Right? So the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval is 6.64 to 20.36. Right? Now, what's your conclusion then? You can't just stop here. What does this actually mean? What this actually means is that, just like what confidence intervals means, I'm 95% sure the actual mean difference pre and post lies within this value. Right? But that just tells me, in general, what, what, the, what is the general meaning of a confidence interval? What about for this particular case? Do chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients benefit from the special diet? Now, if you remember, when we did it earlier, when we had our confidence interval, we were comparing to the known population mean. For example, just now it was like 110, and we wanted to see whether 110 fell within the confidence interval. So in this case, what is the value that we are comparing to, to make a conclusion? Now, do chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients benefit from a special diet, meaning that is there a difference? So you have to think of it the opposite way. If there is no difference, what do you expect D mean to be? Or D bar to be, sorry, the mean difference to be? If there is no difference, you expect it to be 0. So is 0 within this range? No, 0 is outside of this range. Therefore, your conclusion then is yes, chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients do benefit from the special diet. Or in more general terms, the special diet does affect the pre and post values for chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients. Right? So we do it again, this time using hypothesis test. All parameters still stay the same. Do chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients benefit from the special diet? Do a hypothesis test at alpha 0 0.1. So let's stick it to two tails for now. And don't forget to uh, state the null hypothesis. Okay, so in this case, the null hypothesis would be the chronic hypercapnic respiratory patients do not see any uh, change or any benefit from the special diet. Now, strictly speaking, if you want to see benefit, you have to do a one-tailed test where you're testing greater than. But let's assume for now we're just looking at, is there, do you see any kind of difference? Is there any kind of change, right? So H0 would be no change. There's no, there's no benefit, there's no detriment from the special diet, or in other words, the 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 population the population mean difference okay is zero right similar to the confidence intervals we are checking against zero and of course the alternative hypothesis then would be the population mean difference is not zero right alpha equals zero point one so we check out what's t alpha t alpha at alpha zero point one degrees of freedom n minus one which is in this case seven you should get one point eight nine five calculate the critical ratio of t uh, which is quite straightforward, so you get 4.66 compared to the value and it's obviously greater well into the rejection area, so your conclusion then is that now hypothesis is rejected and therefore chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure patients do see a difference from the special diet okay? because it's two-tailed. We aren't really testing whether it's a benefit or a detriment in this case. Uh, in other words, you're saying that yes, there's a difference seen in, inside the arterial oxygen tension. So we looked at two conditions so far. The first was group versus known mean. The second was paired 
uh, two paired groups and now we have two independent groups meaning they are not paired there's two groups but the individuals here and the individuals there are different okay so you can't match them up so we measure the difference between two groups which are independent the value of one has no effect on the value of the other and there's an assumption we have here and that is the variances of both groups are equal right it's not always true but it's usually negligible when the sample sizes are equal meaning this is more of a problem if your first group is n equals 30 and second group is n equals 40 for example right variances mean the standard deviations um, and not to say equal but more or less equal uh, <coughs> So that leads us to a question. We have one group, two groups, one sample mean, two sample mean, one standard deviation, two standard deviation. Now it's obvious we have one sample mean and another sample mean and we take this one minus this one to get us the difference between the means. However, when we calculate our values, we always calculate the standard error and the standard error is based upon one of the standard deviations. But we have two standard deviations now. So which one do we use? So if you remember the assumptions on nine hypothesis, we were assuming that they are actually, we are assuming that these two actually come from the same population. They're actually one and the same thing. It's not two groups, it's not two groups from two different populations, it's two samples that come from the exact same population, which means that their standard deviation should be more or less the same. Right? So logically, that would mean that the, sam the standard deviation that we use is a kind of average of both of the standard deviations. Now specifically in this case, we call it the pooled standard deviation. And the pooled standard deviation can be calculated from the two standard deviations using this particular formula. And if you notice, they're really just doing an average here, but taking into account that your sample sizes could be different. All right? If you notice here, there's N1 and N2. It's just a... Is, is kind of taking a weighted average of the standard deviations uh, where slightly higher weightage is given to the group which has a larger sample size. Okay, So if this sample size is greater compared to this one, then this standard deviation tends to have a higher, uh, tends to have a higher weightage compared to this one for the final pooled one. And eventually the standard error then is calculated based on the pooled standard deviation and uh, multiplied by square root of n, n over 1 plus n over 2. Okay, so once again, it's a, it's a combination of both of the sample sizes. So let's go to an example. Two independent groups, normally distributed. Carcinoid tumors often arise in the gastrointestinal tract and can cause valvular heart disease, among other things. Researchers were interested with a urinary excretion of 5-HIAA, that's a protein, could be a marker for the disease. Researchers studied 36 subjects, right? So the total is 36, but it's among two groups. So there's the first group is 21. So N1 is 21 with carcinoid height disease, and 15 is control. So N2 is 15. So just to make things interesting, we have come across a situation here where the sample sizes of the two groups which we are comparing is not actually equal, right? Now, uh, for those of you who are keeping track, you may notice here that we might have just violated one of the assumptions we've made in the beginning, which was we're assuming that the variances, uh, one of the assumptions was that the variances of the two groups must be equal, and we say that it's fine as long as the sample sizes are the same, and here the sample sizes are different, so that violates the original assumption, so we cannot do it this way, and that is very true, but in this case, just for the sake of example, let's let it pass. So here's our data. The two independent groups here, 16 on first, 12 on the second. So this is the one. This is the group with carcinoid heart disease, and this is the one with uh, this is the just this is the normal group, the control group. So you have sample mean one, sample mean two, sample standard deviation one, sample standard deviation two. Is there a difference in this particular protein 5H1A excretion for patients with carcinoid heart disease versus that of the normal. Check using 95% confidence interval. Right, so give it a shot. Okay, now you probably went through a few, a few problems here because this, the, the way to do this one is a little bit different. Let's start off first though. What is the T value required? T value here is based upon this 95% confidence interval, but the other thing was the degrees of freedom. So one thing I forgot to mention earlier Degrees of freedom we mentioned is n minus 1. So you might have been thinking sample size would be this plus this, 
which would be let's see now which would be 28 and 28 minus 1 is 27 all right now unfortunately when it comes to two groups two independent groups the degrees of freedom is actually n minus 1 of this plus n minus 1 of this or in other words there are two groups so it's the sum of all of them the sum of the sample sizes minus of 2 because it's n minus 1 n minus 1 so minus 1 minus 1 is 2 so in other words the degrees of freedom here is not 28 it's not 27 it's 26 okay so just one just one thing quick thing to mention and if you check that that's 2.056 multiplied by standard error now the next thing you might have come in uh, come across is that what do you do for the x bar over here some of you may be tempted to say this should be x bar 1 in which case it was this one because we we're saying is there a difference with the carcinoid for is there a difference with the carcinoid heart disease so we're basing it on this one and then after we calculate the confidence interval for this then we compare it to x2 and see whether it lies within the range now actually you could do that you could do this or you could even base it on x2 and compare it to x1 it doesn't matter you, you'll find out you end up with the same answer however to keep things consistent with all the previous ones let's always try to remember let's let's try to work along the way that we are trying to calculate the difference so in this case it's x bar 1 minus x bar 2 which gives us to 208.4 and plus minus this and you get this and your final confidence interval is negative 12.4 to 429.2 huge range here so what are we comparing it to because we are doing a this minus this we are looking at uh, we are looking at the mean difference over here so is there a difference if there's no difference the mean difference should be zero so we are comparing it once again to zero in this case and is zero inside this range yes it is is within the range and therefore our conclusion is nope not enough evidence to suggest that there is a difference in terms of the 5 HIAA excretion between patients with carcinoid heart disease versus the control group right no enough evidence now let's carry out the whole thing again using a hypothesis test once again all the data is the same is there increase in 5 HIA excretion for patients with carcinoid heart disease do a hypothesis test at alpha equals 0 0.5 now once again I mentioned here increase which means strictly speaking I should be doing a one-tailed test but ignore this for the moment and let's pretend we just want to ask is there a difference in the 5 HIA excretion or in other words do a two-tailed test so give it a shot once again remember to do the uh, remember to state the null hypothesis <coughs> all right now the null hypothesis in this case as mentioned just now is that there is no difference in the 5-HIA excretion for patients with carcinoid heart disease versus uh, the versus the 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 5-HIA excretion for the control group or in other words my H naught is the mean the population mean of the carcinoid group is the same equals to be the population mean of the control group right and of course the alternative hypothesis then is that the population mean is not the same not equal to the population mean of the control group right now t alpha alpha equals 0 0.1 so we calculate that degrees of freedom once again is n minus 1 plus n minus 1 so in this case 26 you should get 1.706 okay t critical ratio mean 1 minus mean 2 divided by standard error don't forget standard error here is the put standard error of course you had to do that previously in the con confidence intervals as well if you run that out you should get a t of 1.96 let's compare 1.96 versus 1.706 this is obviously greater than this therefore it is in the rejection region conclusion yes there's enough evidence we reject the null hypothesis and we say that there is a difference in terms of the 5 HIA excretion for patients with carcinoid heart disease versus the control group now a quick question we just did this previously in the confidence intervals and what was our conclusion there we said no not enough evidence to say that there's a difference now we did it with hypothesis testing and we found a difference didn't we say previously that uh, although there are two ways of doing it we should come up with the same conclusion why is that how come the conclusions differ in this case think about it for a few moments all right <coughs> you should have realized the difference here is in terms of alpha previous confidence interval was the 95 percent confidence interval where the equivalent here will be alpha equals 0 0.05 in this case it's alpha equals 0 0.1 all right so in other words we are accepting a more lenient we're, we're setting the the threshold here to be much more lenient compared to the confidence interval previously 
So we've been looking at a couple of different scenarios for our data. But if you notice, all of them still shared a common assumption, which is they were all still normally distributed. Now what happens if the data that we have is not normally distributed? If, I guess in, it's very obviously not normally distributed. It doesn't follow a normal distribution at all. Now, if it is not normally distributed, but it still follows a particular kind of pattern, we can try to transform the data. For example, we can apply a log transformation or a square root transformation to the data. Take, for example, this set of data in terms of survival years. It's quite clearly not normally distributed, but when we apply a logarithm to it, it turns into a normal distribution. Right? It looks it, it is quite clearly normally distributed after that. And we can then take this transformed data and we can use it and apply uh, all the typical kind of statistical tests that we used just now, the t-test for example, and it would be perfectly fine to use them upon the normally uh, to, to use upon the transformed data. It's okay. However, if the data that we have is not normally distributed and when we try to plot it upon a graph, um, it is not clear what kind of distribution it follows or it's not clear whether you could actually transform it into a normal distribution. Meaning, for example, what happens if your, the data that you have is, uh, is quite clearly skewed? In that case, you might have to switch to a different set of procedures. In this case, what we call the non-parametric procedures. These, they are called non-parametric because they are procedures which do not assume a normal distribution. They do not assume, in fact, any kind of uh, theoretical distribution. So they don't have parameters, which is why they call non-parametric. And they're also known as the distribution-free methods. Now you can also use the non-parametric procedures for data which is normal, right? So you can apply. So they are very universal. However, they require a larger difference to show significance, meaning that if you use non-parametric procedures, it's not as easy to show a significant difference. They usually revolve around ranking data and comparing the median, meaning that just like in the, for the parametric methods, the t-test, the z-test, and so on, which involves something around the mean and the standard deviation and finding the critical ratio, they all have followed that same kind of pattern. Non-parametric pa procedures also follows a particular pattern and it usually evolves around ranking, right? Ranking the data and working on the ranks of the data rather than the values of the data themselves. And you'll see that when we uh, show some examples of the non-parametric procedures. So we're going to go through non-parametric methods and just like for parametric methods where you looked at three different scenarios, research type of questions, uh, there are the single groups, there are the paired, and then there's the independent. So we're going to do the same thing for non-parametric, and we start with single groups. Now, despite single groups being the easiest uh, or the most elementary form for parametric, for non-parametric, single groups is actually the most complicated of them all. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see why that is in a moment. Now for single groups, we use something called the sign test. And the idea here is that uh, if the population mean that we are comparing to or the one that we assume is equal to is uh, mu, then there should be a 50% chance that the observations are higher or lower than mu. Or in other words, if we assume that the population mean is this value, it should, it's some value that we're always comparing to. Remember for single groups, it's we have a sample we collect a sample and we compare the sample mean to a known population mean, right? So this is the known population mean. Now, then instead of calculating our sample mean and then comparing our sample mean here to the population mean, what we replace it is with this idea. If this sample actually comes from this population, then roughly half of the values of this sample should be higher than the population mean, and half of the values in this sample should be lower than this particular population mean. And we assume it's because we assume it's kind of symmetrical, right? So this is what we're checking for. There's a 50% chance that observations are higher, 50% chance that they are lower. And we can calculate the probability of the, of the observations that we have, meaning that we have collected these individual observations, then we check how many of them are actually higher, how many of them are actually lower compared to the uh, population mean that we are comparing to. 
we can calculate for example let's say we have 10 uh, we have 10 observations and then we notice that uh, out of these 10 observations 8 of them are actually higher than our than, than our the mean that we are comparing to so what's the probability that uh, 8 out of 10 are higher rather than 8 rather than 5 out of 10 we expect 5 correct so 8 out of 10 so this is a binomial type distribution where the probability that we expect is 0 0.5. So given probability is 0 0.5 and k, which is the number of experiments we did, is 10, right, for the 10 individual observations, and n equals 8 in this case. So p8, k equals 10, and probability of video is 0 0.5. Okay, this is the probability of occurrence. Rather than the expectation of 5, instead we saw 8. Now, if you, came, if you think back to our hypothesis test, however, that's uh, every time we every time we do the hypothesis testing, we're always saying what's the probability of this occurring and the area underneath the curve over here, meaning this and the more extreme. Okay, so we have to do the same thing in this case. So if, when we calculate the p, the probability of eight occurrences occurring, that's only here. Then we have to add in the extreme cases, the ones that are even more extreme than what we observe. So probability of eight occurring and then 9 and then 10, sorry, it should be the other way around, right? So 8 occurring here, and then probability of 9 occurring, or probably of 10. So, so meaning this is what we observe, but we've got to add in what if something even more extreme occurred. So P plus 8 plus 9, all the way until the maximum value, which is if we only had 10 individuals here, so probability that all 10 of them were higher, right? And we add all this together, and we get a P value. And this only gives us the p-value of assuming we were doing a one-tailed test. If you want to do a two-tailed test, we double this p-value because we assume kind of that it's symmetric. And when, and when the probability that we expect is 0 0.5, then whether it's higher or whether it's lower, we, we're, we're kind of like measuring the, manually measuring the two ends of the distribution here. Right? So what do we do with this final p-value that we've calculated? We compare it to our alpha. So if our alpha, let's say, is set at 0 0.05 for a two-tailed test, then we look at our the p that we have calculated. Is it higher or lower than this alpha? And if it's lower, then we say we uh, reject the null hypothesis and so on and so forth. So you see, we still use the framework of a hypothesis test. But, but the method of going through it, the method of calculating the p, becomes extremely painstaking, right? So we seldom, we really seldom, we seldom do we use the sign test, but you still have to get an idea. I hope this starts to give you an idea about how non-parametric uh, tests work. Remember, throughout the entire step that we went through here, we didn't actually make use of the values, the individual values of the individuals that we counted, that, that we observed. We only made use of the observation that how many of them, regardless of how high or how low the value of this, how many of those values were actually greater or less than the mean value that we are comparing to? So let's try it out with some actual data. And this comes from, this is similar, this is the same data as what we did previously for the parametric group. So we've got nine patients here. And these are their PI max values. And we're comparing them to the known standard mean of 110. So we're going to follow the same procedures as doing a hypothesis test. And so we need to state the null hypothesis, alternate hypothesis, and all that as well. And we kind of assume two-tailed tests, where the and the alpha value is 0 0.05. So give it a shot. Okay, so if this is a hypothesis test, we've got to start with the H0 or the null hypothesis, which in this case would be saying that our sample group here, the population mean is equal to be the population mean of the standard, uh, standard normal population, or in other words, they are the same. In other words, you're saying that the population mean of this sample, of this group of, uh, I can't remember what they were again. Um, anyway, this this group of patients, their, their population mean is 110 centimeter, uh, 110. Now, keep in mind here though, there's a slight difference. Once we start using non-parametric methods, we, not, we are not really talking about the mean value anymore. Strictly speaking, we're talking about the median value because that was the assumption we we're testing. We we're saying that, we are, we are saying that the value that we are testing, roughly, if it were true, then half of them will be higher, half of them will be lower, right? And the only thing, and and the only, 
and the only measure where, which fits that is actually the median, not the mean, right? So you could also replace this by saying that the hypothesis, the null hypothesis is the median of this group is 110. And of course, the alternative hypothesis is not 110, okay? Now, let's assume two-tailed tests, alpha value equals 0 0.05. How do we continue then? So instead of doing the critical ratio and everything else, we start by calculating the actual raw probabilities, and we assume binomial distribution. We are since half up, half down, so the probability should be 0 0.5. Now let's have a quick count. Out of these 9, how many are actually higher or lower than 110? Right? Now we notice in this case, at least in this case, all of them are smaller than 110. So that's 9, 9 out of 9. So this probability, what's the probability of 9 out of 9 occurring? So this is the typical binomial formula, and we get 0 0.02. Now are we done? Actually, we're not strictly done yet. We were supposed to calculate uh, what we observe plus anything more extreme. But in this particular case, there's nothing more extreme than 9 out of 9. There's no such thing as 10 out of 9, for example. So we've literally hit the most extreme case. So this is it. P9, zero, zero, I mean, the probability of all 9 occurring is 0 0.002, right? Now since it's two-tailed, we got to double this to 0 0.0, to, so it's 0 0.004. The alternatively, we could have said what's the probability of the opposite happening, so the, the one that's just as extreme as this, which in this case would be uh, 9 out of 9, right? instead of 9 out of 9 lower, 9 out of 9 uh, higher, okay? and it will get exactly the same value, which is why we just multiply by 2. So multiply by 2 is 0 0.002, we compare it to our alpha of 0 0.05, obviously this is smaller and therefore we reject the null hypothesis and say that yes, the mean, or in this case the median, of this particular sample group, that this comes from the population mean or population median of this sample group is different from 110. Now let's move on to paired groups. For paired groups here, we use something called the Wilcoxon sign ranked test. Now earlier I mentioned that for non-parametric groups, they revolve roughly around the median and usage of the ranks. And so far we haven't seen that yet, but now we are introducing the idea of how we make use of ranks. Now remember these paired groups here, so in when we compare one group here and one group here, is the individuals are matched against each other, and then there are differences between them. Okay, so once again we have two groups. Okay, the individuals here are matched. There are differences here, and sometimes the dif sometimes let's say the let's say we're talking pre and post. Okay, or group A and group B. Sometimes an individual in group A is higher compared to in group B. And sometimes the individual is higher in group B compared to group A. So sometimes the difference is positive, sometimes the difference is negative. Okay? So the idea here is that if there is no real difference, that's our null hypothesis, then the rank pairs which show a decrease should roughly cancel out the rank pairs which show an increase. Now notice there's a slight difference here. It's not just we're saying that 50% of them uh, show an increase and 50% of them show a decrease. Now we are talking about, uh, now if we look at that, we first calculate all the absolute differences. So the difference here, let's say it does increase, positive 10, then there's a decrease, negative 5, then positive 8, then negative 4, and so on and so forth. Okay. So after we get all these differences out, then we ignore the sign. We ignore whether it was positive or negative, and we start to rank them. So we rank them, okay, 10 is greater than 8, so obviously the rank's higher. And then 8, next one, maybe after that, 6, and then 5, and then so on. So we, have, we rank them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, in terms of their absolute values. After we have ranked them, meaning we have replaced D, we have replaced the absolute value of D with the rank, its rank, whether it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, its position, in terms of its magnitude. After we have done that, we apply back the original sign, let's say it was positive 10, and now it's become rank number 1, so now it becomes a positive 1. And the next one was negative 8, so it becomes rank number 2, so negative 8 becomes negative 2, and so on and so forth. And assuming all of that is done, then, then we apply the t-test as if it was a parametric t-test on the ranks themselves. Okay? So there's positive 1, there's negative 2, da 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 da, da and so on and so forth. And assuming they are the same, then they should roughly cancel out. Right? And we'll illustrate, uh, it's probably easier to illustrate by example. As before, this data is similar to what we did in the parametric test for paired groups, 
but if you've noticed I've just switched a couple of values around just to make things interesting so we have a pre group and we have a post group and we can calculate the difference now look sometimes there's an increase this is the absolute difference mind you so 82 minus 70 is 12 right so this is the absolute difference and sometimes it's positive sometimes it's negative so 62 so 54 minus 62 in this case is negative 8 so what do we do after this we ignore the sign we ignore the sign and we just rank the absolute values over here now we can rank them in terms of the highest being 1 or the lowest being 1 it doesn't matter just be make sure you're consistent so let's say let's start off with the lowest being 1 and the highest being the highest rank for example so the lowest in here would be 4 so that's number 1 then the next one will be 7 so that's number 2 8 3 the next one is uh, 12 but there are two 12s so that's a uh, so that's uh, 4 and 5 and the average of that is 4.5 and after 12 comes 16 so that's 6 then 19 that's 7 and finally 30 which is 8 so notice we have changed them on to ranks then the final step is we apply back the sign the original sign of the difference to the ranks themselves so the 4.5 becomes positive 4.5 then 2 then and so on and so forth here the negative here so it becomes negative 3 right so now these are the signed ranks the signed ranks of the difference and the final step then is to use the t-test and apply the t-test upon these values rather than these values okay so we carry that out using a normal hypothesis test as if we were just doing for a parametric test so give it a shot okay so if you followed it through your hypothesis your now hypothesis then should be there's no difference pre post all right or in other words the uh, the, the the population mean of the difference should be zero okay or the population mean of the signed ranks should be zero doesn't matter we can just skip it and just say d equals zero right and the null hypothesis sorry that's the null hypothesis alternative hypothesis of course that is not zero so let's carry it out if we can set that well obviously we need to do the same thing as always so we set alpha value 2 tail 0 0.05 and then we can calculate t alpha uh, the t alpha of 0 0.5 uh, same thing has to happen degrees of freedom n minus 1 uh, I'm not going to put it here in this case you can just check it for yourself but next up calculating the t the critical ratio or the t test statistic this would be the mean of the signed ranks of the differences right which in this case if you calculate the mean of this is only 0 0.5 standard error is based upon the standard error is based upon the standard deviation of this divided by square root of n as always and you will come up with this value of t right and you take this value and you compare it to your t alpha and then from there you make a conclusion which if i'm not mistaken the conclusion in this case would be uh, there is insufficient evidence to show that there is a uh, difference between pre and post uh, values okay now notice here once again I'd just like to point out that compared to the sign test here we actually do use some we do use something about the values of the difference here in, but instead of using the absolute values themselves we make use of the rank so in other words it's okay it's okay to let's say half of them are positive and half of them are negative you will still see a, in the sign test if half are positive half are negative you might not find a significant difference but in this case if half are positive half are negative but the positive ones are all of the very large values for example if one two three four five let's say the only four of them were positive but it was like 12 12 19 30 and the negative ones were like 8 5 4 3 you would still find a significant difference because then the positive ranks will all be very high the negative ranks will all be very low and the difference and the mean difference between them then would be quite large right so it makes use of the positioning it makes use of the ranking in this case unlike the sign test which only makes which only counts how many are higher how many are lower now what is the benefit of doing this the benefit of doing this is that if you notice this guy here he might be called an outlier he might be called an outlier but in the case when you use non-parametric he's no longer an outlier he is just the highest value the highest rank eight compared to seven is well is just eight compared to seven whereas 30 compared to 19 is quite a big difference 
right so it's no longer an outlier it's just part and parcel it's just just another value now let's finish off with the last type which is two independent groups in this case non-parametric we use the man whitney u test also known as the wilcoxon rank sum test now the idea here is very similar to the paired groups if there's no real difference the number of lower and higher ranked observations in each group should roughly cancel each other out now the now the idea here is you rank all observations regardless of group now just like in pad we ranked the differences regardless of their sign correct now in this case we rank all the observations regardless of which group they're in whether they're group 1 or group 2 keep in mind that this no longer pad so there's actually observations from here and here and so you kind of like merge them together and then you rank all of them as at one go right so we've got ranks now and after you have ranked them, you replace the rank values back into their individual groups. For example, if you consider all observations as a whole, maybe this was rank 1, this is rank 2, this is rank 3, this is rank 4, this is rank 5, this is rank 6, this is rank 7, this is rank 8, this is rank 9, and so on and so forth. Make sure that when you rank them, you keep in mind which group they came from. Even though when you rank them, you're considering them as a whole. And then finally, you perform the t-test as, just as if it was a parametric test on the ranks comparing the two groups so the mean rank here compared to the mean rank here once again we'll look at an example and hopefully we'll make it quite clear as before the experimental observations data here is similar to when we're looking at parametric data so we have two groups here a disease group and a control group and we want to compare and see whether they are uh, we didn't even bother to say what it is now we just say this is the data values we just compare and say whether the data here is similar to the data here so what do we do remember first of all we look at all these values and we pretend they are all in uh, they are all considered as one bunch of data then we rank them all so we first look for the smallest value smaller value here that's number one next one 23 2 next one 43 3 next one 64 next one uh, 73 5 then 6 is here 119 uh, 7 7 now suddenly comes here so here's number 7 so it's 120 and number 8 is 124 here then number 9 135 and number 10 is let's see what is number 10 oh, number 10 is here 153 number 11 is 196 and number 12 is here 220 and so on and so forth all the way until you've ranked each and every one of them which in total is uh, 28 values after you've done all this, so you have all the ranks on this group and all the ranks on this group, then you perform it as if these were the values. You perform a t-test, an independent t-test, as if these were the values you are going to uh, uh, check your mean sample mean differences on, right? So you're calculating the sample mean of this, sample mean of this, and you are going to calculate the difference over the standard error and so on and so forth. So give it a try. Okay, as before, if this was our hypothesis test, then your null hypothesis here would be that the the mean of the the population mean of this particular group, the disease group, is the same as the population mean of the control group, or in this case, the population median is the same as the pop, as the control group median. But okay, to keep things to keep things standardized, we'll just continue using mean, right? So the mean of this equals to be the mean of that. That is the null hypothesis. And of course, the alternative hypothesis is that the mean of this is not the mean of this. Then we follow the usual, which is two-tailed test, alpha equals 0 0.05. And so we get the T alpha of 0 0.05, where in this case, the degrees of freedom, again, n minus 1, n minus 1. So degrees of freedom is 26. Look up. It would be the exact same value uh, as before. I'm not showing it here. Uh, the important thing here is then the T statistic or the critical ratio in this case. So the T statistic here, previously compared to the just now's one, it was the sample mean one minus sample mean two divided by put standard error. In this case, it's sample uh, mean of the rank one minus sample mean of the ranks two divide by the standard error, the standard error, standard deviation of this, standard deviation of this, and you calculate the put standard deviation, and from the put standard deviation, you calculate the put standard error, right? But you go through the whole scenario, and you come across your final answer over here, and you compare it to your T alpha as before, right? And as before, depending, depending whether this is greater than your T alpha, then you would conclude that 
yes, the reject the null hypothesis, etc., etc., and if it's not greater, then you say not insufficient evidence to reject, right? As before, the only difference here is this extra ranking step, right? I hope that's made it clear between the difference between non-parametric and parametric groups. Now, one last point. I hope you've noticed that for non-parametric groups, we have only been using hypothesis testing. Notice we did not use estimation or confidence intervals in any way. And the reason is confidence intervals doesn't really work for, uh, for non-parametric methods because we're working on ranks. So if I gave a confidence interval, actually we'd be returning a confidence interval in terms of ranks rather than in terms of values. And obviously, it doesn't really make much sense to return confidence intervals in terms of ranks because if I gave you the confidence interval in terms of ranks, you wouldn't know what to do with it. So you'd be saying, okay, so I'm saying that the, the actual true rank lies within here to here. That doesn't really mean anything. I don't know how to apply that to the real world scenarios because in real scenarios, I'm interested in the value. I'm not interested in the ranks, and I wouldn't know, even know how to translate the values into ranks. So that's why it doesn't really make sense to use confidence intervals for non-parametric uh, data. Right?